proceeding with the formal business of the meeting, I would ask Pastor Denny to lead us in prayer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And may I begin before praying? Just a couple of words, if I may. And the few words are these, that often we remember voluntary groups and charities, especially at a time like this, because of the great work that they'd put in. But we often overlook councillors, chief executives. And I want to put on record tonight a big thank you for the leadership that's been shown by yourselves, the leader along with all the councillors, because it's been a tough time for our town. And to get through it the way we have isn't by accident. So thank you all very much, and may you continue to do all the great work you've been doing. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, we thank you today that we can even do what's necessary in the governance of this town. We thank you for the leadership that's been shown by all your the councillors of this town and the chief executive and all the officers. And I pray a special blessing upon the proceedings today. We pray for wisdom, that they will exercise wisdom in the areas of what's right and what's good for all, or as many as is possible. Favor them with this wisdom, because we do need it, Lord. Life has been very tough for our town, but through your goodness and through the help of so many, we are here and we can meet in this manner after a very long time. Bless all. Thank you today in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Or after, I think. After members, after. So, so yeah, can you read this? Then, then speakers. Then the minutes are out. It is, it is my very sad duty to report the death of Lord Mackenzie of Luton on 2nd of December 2021. The late Lord Mackenzie first served as a councillor from 1976 until 1992 and returned in 1999, serving another six years, including period as a leader of the council. Bill, as he was fondly known throughout all his roles, was one of the town's most ardent supporter and servant. In a local political career spanning more than 40 years, his warm, approachable manner and dedication to late Luton meant he secured a, pl a place of deep, lasting affection throughout the town. Bill was respected by all members in this chamber and his peers in, in the House of Lords. He was simply, he had no graces. He was simply a bill himself. And that's the most decent man I have met in my life. Does any member wish to speak? Councillor Simmons. Mr. Mayor, and it is with great sadness that I get up and uh, honour Bill McKenzie this evening. Um, he was not just a colleague, he was a friend. And I knew him for a long time. He was very loyal. Um, he had a wicked sense of humour and uh, he was very kind and considerate and spent his entire life doing what he could do for the people of this town, uh, whether it be as a local war councillor, as leader of the council um, or indeed as a lord of the realm. Um, I think uh, I will miss his uh, help and advice uh, a great deal and I'll miss his company. Um, and I wish him uh, all the rest uh, and peace he can find. And I'm sure tonight we all wish our thoughts are with Diane and his family at this very sad time. Councillor Franks. 
I, I enjoyed working uh, with Bill over many years, and I guess the most enjoyable were when I was first elected way back in 1983, um, when uh, especially after a housing committee meeting, when Bill and I and several others retired to the odd fellows for a few pints and yeah it it finished and rounded off the evening very well and it's it's amazing the number of occasions when uh i've had conversations with bill that uh, often involved a glass of beer in hand not always but quite often and uh, last few years mainly our interaction has been seeing each other in Sainsbury's on a Saturday morning, um, um, having a little chat with, with him and Diane. Yes, uh, thoughts are with Diane. Um, she was always by his side um, and, and supporting him in, in every way. I just hope that there is now someone beside Diane's side supporting her. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I first met Bill when I came on the council in 2003. Although we were on different sides of the fence, I could talk to him. But the best I found with Bill was when he left the council. We used to meet up into bumping to each other. We used to have some very good conversation. And he's, he was really a nice person. And I hope his family give them all my condolences. Thank you. Councillor Kant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I first met uh, Bill while campaigning and knocking on doors, and he was one of those leaders who encouraged residents to participate in the democratic process. A uh, very pleasant man, man of knowledge, man of passion, and most important of all, Lutonian at heart. Um, when I used to see both Diane and uh, Bill, I used to really be impressed with their love and respect for one another. Uh, you would always dress very eloquently, speak and, and, and always well dressed. And uh, um, he, he respected people. That's why he got respect back. And I think he was he's one of the only politicians that I know which, who's widely respected across the party, across the communities, because it's what he offered to everyone. So um, we'll miss him daily and we wish uh, the best for Diane and our sympathies. And uh, I extend our support for her if she needs us at any time. Thank you. Councillor Javiria, and. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's actually very sad to lose Lord Mackenzie. Um, he was my mentor and he encouraged me. Um, he, one of the things we both shared was passion for sports, um, especially cricket and also, um, you know, love for Luton Town Football Club. Um, Luton has lost a somebody who was very supportive of Luton and somebody who was very proud and passionate about Luton. So Luton has inevitably lost uh, Lord Luton and it's very sad and of course um, prayers and condolences to all his friends of which of uh, which there are very many and also to Lady Di Mackenzie. Thank you. Councillor Burnett. Yeah I just wanted to so I've been reflecting on the times that I've known um, Lord Mackenzie, and having spoken to quite a few people within the, the Caribbean and African community in Luton, many have very fond memories of him. And I've um, and they've also said that they when they've approached him for support on services or to develop to develop new service that was culturally specific to their needs, he was also welcoming and tried his best. And um, one person mentioned about the mental health provision that was provided for um, called uh, um, Ashanti Nai Bingi that used to be off um, um, Marsh Road. And I also remembered when I got married, I 
really unexpectedly got a lovely card from both Diane and, and Bill out of the blue. So he's done a lot for the town and, and I know that we all will miss him. And he was always approachable no matter who the person was to speak to. So my condolence, and I know many from my from the African and Caribbean community goes out to him. I remember the last event I was with him, one that stands out really strongly in my mind, was the Kente Festival um, back in 2019 before the pandemic um, struck. And he partook in all of the food. He tried, he tried everything. Nothing was out of limits for him. So my condolences are um, with him and his family. And I know that Diana's missed, will be missing her best friend. Thank you. Councillor Malik. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Bill was a great friend of the people of Luton. And uh, I always found him very uh, caring, very humble pers uh, person in my political life. Uh, he supported all my charity events when I was a mayor in uh, 2019 to 2020. And um, um, uh, personally, I think People of Luton will never forget him. Thank you. Councillor Vaid Akbar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I met uh, uh, Bill uh, in 94. And uh, since then, um, we have been working together. When he was a leader, he was very supportive. And I have learned uh, quite a lot from him. And as the previous speaker said, he was approachable, accessible to everyone. Um, no matter what time you call him, whether it is midnight or not, you know, he will come to see you or he will give you right advice. And um, he's, uh, he's also, he was a, a, was, um, a, prof a professional pol politician, but not conspirator. I think he will say uh, on, you know the people's face what he thinks and what his um, actually his views are and uh, sometimes the consequences when he spoke um, could have been different but he said that is my principle he had to um, tell the other person what his views are and what his position is and uh, uh, i think uh, bill will be missed um, thoroughly by us and by Luton as a whole, he has actually served, as you said, um, uh, over 40 years. And uh, uh, I think uh, we all will miss him and my condolences to Dai and his, and his family. Thank you. Any other member wish to speak? I'd ask members for one minute silence. Please stand. Good evening, welcome to the meeting of the Council. Before we begin, would the members please sit in their allocated seat, wear the face covering unless exempt at all times when not speaking. Scan the NHS COVID app at the entrance to the chamber, silence their mobile phone and stand up when proposing or seconding the items. Switch the microphone on to speak and up immediately after. If there is an emergency, turn left out of the chamber, follow the green emergency exit, 
sign to the Man Town Hall entrance and assemble in St. George's Square. This meeting is being live streamed to the public. Any member of the public present are entitled to take photograph, film, audio record and report on all public meetings in accordance with the Openness Local Government Regulation 2004. People may not, however, act in any way considered to be disruptive and may be asked to leave. Before proceeding with the evening agenda, I have a player inviting Fester Archipel, the Police and Crime Commissioner, to answer question of member of the council. So welcome, Fester, and thank you for attending. That's just. Yes, OK. Well, a very good evening to you all, and uh, I think it's still appropriate for me to wish you a happy new year. I don't think I've met, I've seen most of you yet, so um, I think I can officially still do that until the end of February. So uh, happy new year to you all. And I've got to say, what a moving tribute that you all paid to uh, Lord Mackenzie. Uh, I remember seeing him uh, last year at an awards uh, dinner, and what an absolutely gracious uh, man he was. And uh, the mood in the room, I think, very well captured the huge loss that it is. And, and I want to go on record as well in uh, paying my deepest condolences and um, sending my prayers and, and, and thoughts upwards on behalf of his wife and family. Well, I, I really wouldn't um, uh, say much. Uh, you've seen me before uh, last year, and I want to just use the time that I have to answer any questions that you might have. I think that would be the best thing to do rather than me giving you a speech, which you probably don't want to listen to anyway. Uh, so I'd rather just take your questions if any of you have questions for me. Members of the council, do you have any questions for the Police and Crime Commissioner? <laughs> Councillor Khan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, thank you for coming to our council. Um, as you know, uh, gang and knife crime has been prevalent, not just in Luton, but uh, uh, in th in the country, but our per percentage of uh, the gang and knife crime seems to be a lot higher than some of the other towns. It's aff affecting and has affected a lot of people's lives. It's a problem that we all need to resolve, and the the responsibility falls on your shoulders more than others. Um, we really want to understand that how will you address this gang and knife crime, which is now deeply rooted, and some of it is linked to county lines. Um, the, the perpetrators seem to be getting younger and younger. Um, so if you could start with that, and then there may be follow-up questions. Thank you. Very, very good question there, uh, Councillor Khan, and uh, no pressure there in you outlining to everyone that the, the burden of the responsibility falls more squarely on my shoulders than anybody else. Uh, whether that is true or not, that is uh, debatable, but for my part, I take very seriously this issue of county lines and the serious violence that goes along with it. But one thing that we cannot get away from is the fact that there is a thriving market for drug use in our county. That That is an issue because by the time we start focusing on the stabbings and the, the, the violence, I think we probably need to step a bit further back and look at the main drivers of this um, criminal activity. So um, that is something I think we need to bear in mind. For my part, what I'm looking at, what, how I'm dealing with this is threefold. One is around the prevention or early intervention part. Then there is the enforcement part, which I can talk about in a second, and perhaps Jamie can say a few words about that as well. Uh, but also there's the treatment part, which fits in nicely with the 10-year drug strategy that the government have now got in place, which in fact, this morning I was in, this afternoon rather, I was in a meeting with Kid Malthouse, the policy minister, where I asked about what is the funding um, uh, pipeline for the 10-year drug strategy that, they've, that they've, the, re, the government announced um, late last year. And he was able to confirm that about 500 million pounds is actually going to go into just drug treatment alone. We have never ever seen that kind of investment going into treating addiction for drugs and alcohol, because whilst we want to deal with the enforcement part, we also have to deal with the demand side. 
And the evidence shows that more and more people are addicted to um, class A and class B drugs in our communities. In some of the rural areas, some of the affluent middle class areas, there are a lot of people who are buying drugs, not just the homeless and uh, people, roughly possessed. People tend to think so. On the one part, so we're putting money into the, the treatment side. The enforcement bit is also quite interesting. Now, you see a lot of the, uh, the drug dealing and the gangs and so on and so forth. But what you don't get to see is the top level and the middle level gang leaders who are being taken down. Just um, some of you might have seen on social media last year, a chap who was waving away around Rolex. Did you see? I just called him the Rolex uh, guy. He was running around Rolex. Um, when he was caught, he said it wasn't him, but unknown to him, at the end of the video clip, actually said his name. And he was caught. It was a very, very well known uh, nominal to Bedfordshire Police. And that drugs gang was taken down. So there are several of these county lines who are, that are being taken down in Bedfordshire. But because there's so many of them, and I've got to tell you, and I don't think there's anything wrong with me putting this in public domain, I've heard estimates of about 200 to 500 kilos of Class A drugs coming through Luton a month. That is a lot. Now, that is, that's not just there to satisfy the local market, it's also to send around as a, count, as a main county line. So that is a big issue. From a prevention side, you've got the Violence Reduction Unit, which do a fantastic work in dealing with kids who are just on the verge. To engage with young people and share them my story. Having, you know, had a young boy that I was mentoring, you know, been to death. You know, so I've seen that. I've had friends who've been into prison. And just share my story with this guy that you can actually be successful in life without joining a gang. And I think we need more people from this room, from our communities, to actually talk with our young people that there are other ways to be successful and make a living without having to be part of a gang. And unfortunately, the reality is that the competition against people like you and me is so far greater. When they start looking at social media and the influence of other kind of uh, influence that these young people are having. So we're putting money into the into the into their prevention. We put in invest, investment into the enforcement through the Op Costello, which is having some um, success. And also we're putting in money into the uh, the treatment part, which I'm afraid we just can't ignore. But it takes all of us to deal with this, not just me. No, thank you. Also, we have a single focus and vision that is eradicating poverty, which is linked to gang and knife crime. And, and there's a whole host of uh, opportunities being created and to aspire young people to, you know, take the jobs which will lead them into professional careers and high paid jobs. And hopefully that will address, but that will take a, a longer uh, a, a period of time. But enforcement is such an important part of is policing and we do appreciate that you've had some successes but having that early intelligence is the is gangs linked although everything is going through luton is linked to other parts of of the the country like london a lot of those londoners are coming into luton they've chosen luton as 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 a base now how do we protect luton from external forces using luton soil we know luton soil has been used too many times and when you have these gangsters fighting on the street and outside our schools, while we're doing all that hard work, then all that effort goes to drain sometimes and you have to start all over again. So that's why policing and enforcement becomes a critical issue and is, is linking that preventing, you know, it's, it's not just preventing, you know, gangs within Luton, but Luton soil to be used. Have you got any anything around no, that? You know, I, I Look, I'll, the way that I always do, I've always done things, to be honest, uh, whenever I've been to any local, local authority, I'll tell them exactly how I see it, where I, based on what I hear. I wish I could say to you it was just a case of people from London moving into Luton. The fact of the matter is that there are people who are born and bred in Luton who are deep in the game. That's just a fact. Let's not delude ourselves and think that people from Luton are coming into, people from London are coming into Luton or vice versa. Luton is now a net exporter of county lines to other parts of the country rather than you know an importer but that's not to say that there are not many wonderful things going on 
I know some of the schemes that the local authority are putting in place, which is fantastic. I know of things which the Vero are doing, which the police force are doing, which the churches and the mosques are, and several faith groups are doing to try and keep people off the streets, to try and eradicate poverty. I think all of those things are fantastic. What I think we need to do more of, and my office has been working closely with, with Adam, uh, Adam Divney to try and see how we can actually align more of our commissioning so that there aren't any gaps. Because what has been happening in the past is that, you know, funding has been going here and there. There isn't any coordination. And in some cases, you have been a, a duplication of funding, which is not really helping. But at the same time, whilst one area has been duplicated in funding, other areas have been missed out entirely. So now what we're trying to do is to get a mapped exercise so that I know exactly what Luton Borough Council are commissioning. Then my office can also um, co-fund with that. So I think there's some really positive things happening. But look, I can't say to you here that I have got all the answers and no one has, to be quite frank with you. The scale of the problem is ginormous and it's going to take all of us, the NHS, the schools, uh, the police, the local authorities, everyone really working together in a co coordinated way to tackle this issue. But I, I really do believe that we can. I believe we can. So, uh, Low level antisocial behavior is also linked onto this when we looking at these guys driving fancy cars, speeding, overtaking, and pu putting people's lives at risk. It doesn't seem to be a priority uh, for the police at this time in the moment. It doesn't appear. Yeah, speeding on the streets, on your residential areas. Um, and that that is, is growing. So uh, it doesn't seem to be a priority area. Is there anything that you are looking to do to prevent this from happening? What I can actually say to you, um, Councillor, is that based on the recent figures that I saw and, and reported antisocial behaviour in Luton actually gone down since October last year. And that is not just down to the police. Uh, and, and, and I think um, it's important that the people of Luton give a lot more credit to the, to the council for the work that is being done. We've seen a huge amount of um, joined up work between Bedfordshire Police and the local authority to drive to drive down things like antisocial behaviour. And I think one of the impacts of that is that we've seen reported antisocial behaviour going down since October, November last year. Uh, will it continue to go down? I wish I can say that to you, but I can't promise that. But I'm sure if we can't carry on working together, we will still keep seeing more positive impacts. Before I come to the next member, can I ask uh, somebody's car is blocking in the car park LR 66 U O F or V O F U O F V O F. I think Mr. Mayor, that was Khadija. She's gone. Yeah, she's going to move. I think. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Abbas uh, Mr. Mayor, can I come at the end, please? Because I have questions and something else to say as well. So I'll do it at my turn at the end. Yeah, I'll do it at the end. OK. All right. Festus, nice seeing you, my friend. And I'm, I do appreciate that you had another schedule today, but you took time out to come and visit us and cancel the other engagement. Um, I have a few questions. Because you started off the 10 year drug strategy, so I'll start with that one first. Um, so when there's a new drug strategy, that means your previous drug strategies have failed or they've not worked properly. So that's why you need to do another one. OK, so you've had six uh, drug strategies in the last quarter century. And today, hearing from yourself, 200 kilograms of drugs passes through Luton every month. Yeah, that is the outcome of your previous drug strategies. And I have questions regarding your new drug strategies because on pages 17 and 18, if you look at them, they cover the north of England. They do not do nothing for the centre of England, whereas Luton down here is all up north. So I would like to know that this is a 10 year strategy. OK, what is, what is your forward plan for Luton and Bedfordshire going forward for two years on from this? Obviously, there's a lot of money coming um, from this strategy. You're... First of fairness to everyone who's listening, 
it would be good if the question was if you gave me a chance to answer the question rather than ask like three questions in a row. Otherwise, I might forget. So let me just answer that one in the first instance about the 10 year drug strategy, if you don't, if you forgive me. Well, here's the thing. The 10 years drugs, drug, drug strategy um, does not mean that what was happening, what was in place before um, was was a failure, whatever the case might be. I think it's always a good thing to be able to see if something needs to be changed or something needs to be re-emphasized. That is a positive thing. Uh, what I think the government were doing initially in my view, needed to be changed, which was a primary focus on enforcement. And as I've just said at the beginning, we are not going to deal with this drugs issue just by arresting everybody. We just can't. There aren't enough prison spaces to arrest every drug dealer, to have, arrest every drug addict or aggressive beggar who is a drug addict. You just can't do it. So you've got to have and you've got to have uh, treatment in places where, and that's what this does. Now, in terms of the rollout and about the map that you've got there, the government are doing it in tranches. Now, they're using very much an evidence-driven um, approach to the rollout of the funding. The first tranche is going to be in the northwest and the northeast, where there is a significantly greater um, uh, prevalence of drug abuse in places like uh, Blackpool and places like that. So they're focusing on those areas first. And my understanding is that Luton, specifically mentioned during the meeting today, is going to be on, I think, the second tranche. So I think they're going with 50 local authorities in the first one, and then in the second year, there will be another 50 local authorities, of which I believe Luton's going to be in that. So it's not going to be in 10 years' time. I hope you're pleased to hear that. We'll see. We'll see. Um, but, but that's good to hear when you saw so Luton is in the second tranche, whenever that is in a couple of years. But it'd be good as a PCC for Bedfordshire to inline this strategy with our CSP which you sit on as well, and which you are a very good partner, uh, may I say so as well. So could we line this with that as well going forward? Yeah, so second question now is regarding vacancies. Okay, so Luton currently has nine vacancies. Okay, and you have promised that just recently in a video where the uh, precept is going up and you'll be recruiting more vacancies yeah because of that precept if it goes up is a survey at the minute if it goes up yeah what will happen to the nine vacancies that are currently not filled in Luton will they be written off in your budget or will you be adding that to the new allotment coming forward about vacancies in the community policing team yeah. and I don't know which which date which constables, two in sergeants, two PCOs, that is four in the south, five in the north. Current is the data you've got in front of you. Sent by your office to me today morning and it is your okay. last quarter. So, the, so for January, here's the data for Luton in total and this is based on what I received from the, the force executive team which is the chief constable and the, um, uh, and the DCC and the ACC. So basically Luton has a budgeted establishment of uh, 24 uh, constables and 20 PCSOs. At the moment, you have got 22 um, constables and 20 PCSOs, making 42 in total of um, community policing assets. That is more than we have in central Bedfordshire, where they have 41 in total. And that is more than we have in Bedford Borough, where we've got 30. One, you're supposed to have 27 in Luton South, 24 in Luton North, brings it down to 51. So that is your, actually what you budgeted for. In, um, I think you might, are you looking at the 72 that's been recruited in the new financial year as a result of the uh, Okay, precept. but going back to my question, will you be adding, moving, yeah. moving these vacancies on to the vacancies that you have promised in your uplifting the precept in vacancies nobody wants to promise vacancies so um, no filling these vacancies i mean yeah they most of them have been filled you've only got one vacancy in the um you've only got one or two vacancies in community at the moment not to these figures they're not by the figures that i got from the chief can constable I, and chief. okay no, no i can come back to you no, with no, the no, correct no. figures if, if can there's I any ask discrepancy here Please strictly answer straightforward, not debate in the same thing, because what I what what the public listening to this this is on live stream listening to you is 
is what do we need to know is what are the facts. The facts must be given to the public. Yeah, so and is it, that's what we are trying to get the, the truth. Thank you. And it's important that the residents of Luton know this because Please. they will be paying this additional uh, amount on the council tax coming in April. You, you, unless you're mistaken, the new numbers that are coming in as a result of the ten pounds precepts increase, which will be seventy two in total. Uh, these are not uh, community. These are going to be response officers. These are going to be some of the victim engagement officers. So seventy two in total. That is across different police functions. If we are looking at the allocation for the community policing teams, which is what you're talking about, I think. The numbers are as what I've given to you here for PCs and PCSOs that are budgeted for Luton and that we're currently having, that we've currently got in place. Just Thank make sure we got the terminologies and the roles right. Because okay. that's very, very important. So don't mistake the 72 that will be recruited next year with what we've got in place at the moment. Okay. I'll, I'll look. Uh, Please, I've got another four or five members. Can you please uh, brief questions and brief answers, please, rather than a long, long, please? If we can, um, then I, that gives a- Chair, I'll finish, I'll finish off now anyway. Yeah, yeah um, please. Two festers now, um, PCO's office. Um, obviously, I had the meeting with you regarding legal campments. Uh, after Councillor Franks, the opposition raised it a few times with me. After your meeting, I have another meeting with your chief exec just recently as well. To, and we, at legal encampment was again mentioned there. Um, obviously, you have taken a big step being a key partner in this in legal encampments, and you offered a liaison officer that we will share with Central Bedfordshire as well. That was a big commitment. Since that meeting, we have issued another 60, section 61 based on evidence that was gathered at the site there. Do you think that your office and the council can do anything more than other than rely on evidence on issuing S uh, section 61s? On the operational side of that, I'd rather have uh, Jamie, if you want to come in, uh, come in on that, because that's very much to do with around the enforcement around those uh, legal instruments. Jamie. Um. Thank you. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Uh, for those that don't know me, uh, Jamie Langworth, I'm the head of community policing here in Luton um, and, and try my best to try and keep uh, keep crime at bay here in Luton. Um, so look, the, the traveller kind of issue uh, is something that has been flying around for, for, for a long time now. Um, there is a new bill that's coming out that's got it, that's had its um, third reading at the House of Lords. And again, I think we, we're a little bit nervous about this new bill because there's lots of things attached to it. One of which, of course, is that it almost gives us the right to kind of have travellers plot up and they're trespassing and we can move them almost immediately. I think we need to be really careful about hanging our hat on that power because it will be challenged really, really quickly. And we know that it will go through a judicial process and that things will change from it. So I just wanted to put that out there and, and kind of talk about what's coming kind of down, down the line. In terms of our powers currently, uh, we have Section 61, which is a police power, and I'll talk very, very briefly about that in a second. And then the, the council have a power to remove um, under their powers. If it's on council land, the agreement is that the council will assess it and understand what it looks like. If it's the police power, what the police power means is that there's some other bits and bobs to, to think about. But ultimately, it's are those people trespassing and are those people stopping others from doing what they're entitled to do that doesn't mean that so for, and, and a quick example of that if they're on a very very large car park hard standing car park and they're taking up five six seven car parking spaces but there's a hundred others that are empty it's hard for us to justify as police to say that people cannot park there because they can so it's a really difficult one for us. And again, when they're on a field, if the rest of the field is completely clear and able to be used, then it's really difficult for us to say that we are that they are stopping people from doing. 
I get the passion behind it. I get that. But what we've got really is a human rights issue, the right to obviously have a private life and live uh, a family life, etc. And then a policing issue and a enforcement issue and a rights issue for other residents and users of whatever that car park stroke um, uh, field is. Really, really challenging. I don't think that there's a quick fix to it. In terms of the Section 61s, we assess it every time that a uh, traveller site moves. We go down and a supervisor assesses it, looks at our contingencies in terms of what, where can we go, what can we do? And again, I'm not going to talk about transient sites and all of that kind of stuff, which has been rolling on for years and central beds who might get one, they might not, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of things to consider. And I think it's a great question, Councillor Abbas, and I think it's still up for debate. But please, 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 nobody hang their hat on this new bill that's coming through, thinking that's going to be the panacea for all our problems, because I don't think it will be. Thank you, thank you. But can I, can I just, before you leave, just to for the public of Luton, Lutonians, is to understand what the, my colleagues were asking question in terms of your enforcement that you are taking all the steps so the public could be assured that the police is doing in terms of Section 61 mm -hmm. what is expected of the police to do. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. So every single time travellers move on, or there's a piece of new information, uh, of course, there could be some antisocial behaviour, there could be some criminal damage, and those kind of reports, we then review that section 61 based on the information and intelligence that we are met with. Thank you. Uh, that was from Samira, she... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for this to be here in our council, and um, a very good... Uh, new, Happy New Year to you as well, because this is the very first attraction we have since the beginning of New Year. Uh, my question is around uh, our young children, you know, the, our young person. Uh, the recent report we had that we, our young children, they lost confidence. They don't feel safe around Luton and they and they, their peers carry uh, uh, knives for their protection. So what I would like to understand that what measures you have taken to restore that confidence so that they feel safe and they, um, you know, they, they can excel in their life, they can, you know, uh, more put, they will be more focused towards their studies. Thank you. Thank you Samara, Samara for that. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to do, and, and thankfully the Chief Constable is very much on board with me on this, is around how we utilise our community policing resources. Uh, I've been very, very focused, because I believe very passionately that the bread and butter of policing is community policing. Uh, if people see, if they see police officers in their communities, out of their schools, engaging with them, interacting with them, uh, they're able to pick up information, they're able to know who, who's doing what, uh, they might even know who's doing what birthday parties, and they, they're part of the community. Uh, and there was an agreement with the Chief Constable and I uh, reached, which is that he was going to make sure that once we have all these extra officers now in community policing, as we now have, that's the most we've ever had in communities that I'm aware of, uh, they would actually be allowed to stay focused on being community police officers on being visible, on being proactive. So now we've got community police officers who are standing in front of schools in the morning, welcoming kids as they come in, saying hello to them, saying hello to their parents in some schools. Now, I wish we had enough police officers to be in front of every single school in Luton. We just do not have that. That would probably take over almost half of all of our uniformed police officers. But that is happening. We've got police officers who are uh, going into schools engaging with children, they're going to events, they're being visible, they're being noticed. And if you follow any of the, uh, the social media uh, feeds, if you're that way inclined, they are now being encouraged to report in a public way, which wasn't really happening before, about their activities and what they're achieving. So just yesterday, I was seeing on social media, uh, a community officer who was doing a, a sweep in a garden, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a park somewhere, and knives were discovered. 
Okay. Uh, the previous week, uh, I read of another officer doing a foot, having a foot chase, and some guy they found, you know, heroin and and cannabis on him. So they're doing more of this. Is there enough? Absolutely not. Is the scale of the problem much more than the resources we have? Categorically, but we're not going to stop. There's a lot that's going on. From my side, again, I've got to say we will keep commissioning services that will protect our young people. I'm going to be providing more longer term commission service um, uh, funding to the youth offending team, for example, so that they don't have to keep reapplying every year. So there's that sustainability there as well for a three year period. So we're trying as much as we possibly can. And one thing I'll say to you finally on that particular issue is this working again very closely with, with Adam and, and Marek. We're trying to make sure that the commission services are married up to the point where I can say as a commission, here's a pot of money. This is what we all want to achieve together as a CSP. Here's that pot of money. You know Luton better than I do. You know what's going on. You know the issues. You commission the services in line with the needs of the local community as long as you deliver these objectives. I think that's a fair way of doing things rather than me micromanaging individual commission services. The CSPs know what's going on, they know the needs, and I think it's only right that we look at working together in dealing with those issues in the communities. Thank you. Can, can, can we Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I'm not finished yet. Um, yeah, I just wanted I, to, yeah, if, before if I, I may. Yeah, can I just, just please, can I ask that, you know, the questions and answers in, in light of the time could be brief, please. Okay. Otherwise, you ask that you have another engagement, and I'm trying to move things on. So can I ask uh, members a, a straightforward question, not a comment, and to you to give as brief answer as possible. I Thank you. I don't know whether, whether, whether I can, uh, I've got a suggestion and to, okay, I, I will be very, very quick. First is, I appreciate that, you know, uh, you don't have that resources. You know, I don't know whether I would be able to, it's my place to give you a suggestion or not, but Please. but I believe that I think it's a good idea being, being you know, corporate parents, we, I think it's a good idea to take some suggestions that, you know, rather than, you know, deploying all sorts of, you know, resources, everything, why don't you engage the children, you know, bring that confidence back into the children's and then, you know, you, the gaps between policing and the, you know, the, the young children have, I think it's a good idea to reduce that gap and to, you know, take the things from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Barnett. Thank you and, and welcome, Festus, and, and, and yeah, Happy New Year. Got a couple of questions. First of all, with regards to the serious youth violence, I want to know how are you and your colleagues in the neighbouring areas like Hertfordshire and Thames Valley, because Luton is not an island and Bedfordshire is not an island. And you rightly said that people live in Luton, but there's connectivity across the area.